I have the pleasure to introduce the second keynote speaker of the conference, Jean-Charles Rocher. Jean-Charles has written fundamental contribution in banking and financial stability, but also in two-sided markets and digital payments. So we thought he would be the ideal speaker for a session that we share between the Central Bank's conference initiated this morning and the PT Initiative conference that will continue later in the afternoon. So Jean-Charles, thanks a lot for having accepted our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Milo. Can you hear me well? We do hear you well. Fantastic. So good afternoon, everyone. It's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to participate uh, in this conference. Um, I have to apologize for presenting very preliminary work. work. Uh, yesterday, Jean was apologizing because his paper was not fully finished. My paper is really, really preliminary. But on the other hand, I was eager to, to get your comments. Uh, so please don't hesitate to interrupt me at any time with questions or uh, comments. Uh, they would be very welcome. So this is based on, uh, and, and, and first of all, uh, again, many thanks to the organizers, to Emma and uh, Milo for, for inviting me. So um, this is based on ongoing research with uh, John Frost and Yun Xin from the BIS and Marianne Verdier from the University of Paris. And the motivation is really simple. Uh, it's really the observation that the traditional business model of banks is uh, jeopardized by two things, fintech innovation and uh, big tech platforms. Uh, fintech innovation allows to unbundle uh, deposits and credit, which were traditionally put together by banks. And on the other hand, big tech platforms are rebundling financial services with uh, their core services. And I will come back to that uh, later. This is the idea of Bruno Mayer, James, and Landau. Moreover, as we saw yesterday in the mobile money uh, session, uh, in emerging countries, the telco operators contribute to financial inclusion by offering payment services as well. So I would like to uh, reintroduce the fantastic title of the paper of Boyd and Gertler in 1994. That was, I, I quote, are banks dead or are the reports greatly exaggerated? And I think uh, at the time it was the issue of uh, um, disintermediation. Uh, uh, and here it's, uh, it's another threat to the existence of banks. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the banks have succeeded uh, to resist the first movements. And that was the, the essence of the paper of Boyd and Gartner showing that in spite of competition by financial markets, banks were able to survive. And uh, uh, today uh, the question is open. And uh, it's even more serious than that because the question may also apply to central banks in the sense that uh, cryptocurrencies threaten monetary sovereignties of countries. So it's the, the traditional model of banks and central banks uh, that is uh, jeopardized by these uh, uh, innovations. So the research question that uh, we want to address in our paper uh, is essentially, what is the socially optimal industrial organization of the payment system in a digitalized economy? In a traditional economy, the economy of the past, uh, we had a so-called two-tier structure between commercial banks and central banks, where co uh, commercial banks manage the retail accounts uh, of the final users and provide financial services to the, to the public, while central bank only manages the reserve accounts of the banks, it's the banker of the bank, um, and uh, the uh, users, the final users, do not access uh, this higher level uh, circuit or payment system. So this is a traditional structure that has been in place for many uh, centuries, actually, for at least two or three centuries. And the question is, is the, this, going, this system going to be preserved by digitalization? The second question related to that is whether uh, an appropriate regulation of payment activities uh, is sufficient to implement the social optimum, or do we need more? Do we need public provision by the central bank in the sense of a central bank digital currency? 
So this is the core research question that I'm going to examine. And as I told you, unfortunately, I have more questions than answers. So this presentation will have two parts. First, I will briefly explain what we already have done in the paper, the model we have built and the preliminary conclusions. But a lot remains to be done. And I will essentially look at the five fundamental questions that condition not only the assumptions and the modeling strategy, but also the interpretation, the policy recommendation of our results. And these questions have been examined in the literature. So I will refer to be a survey of the literature, if you like. And I will give you my personal uh, opinion on, the, on the, uh, the way people have uh, answered these questions. But I believe that uh, uh, we need to answer them uh, before we can have a clear picture of the future of the payment system. So the first question is, is related to what I was saying, are traditional banks going to survive in some way or another? You know, I have always taught in my banking 101 courses that the role of the banks was to provide deposits and credit simultaneously. This is the classical transformation of maturities a la Diamond and Digvig. And the reason was that this was good for the allocation of resource in the economy. The question is, uh, are these old uh, scope economies between deposits and credit still relevant in a digitalized world? or is it going to disappear? That's question number one. Question number two is associated to the new scope economies between payments and platforms. Let's say uh, we're talking of, uh, come back to that, uh, social networks like Facebook or e-commerce platform that like Amazon or Alibaba. So these uh, big techs, these uh, internet giants are bundling, you know, uh, payments, among other things, with their core activities. Uh, is it something that we, we uh, it's, it's probably something we cannot avoid, it will be like that. Question is, how can the, the regulator or public authority take this into account in order to provide the best uh, allocation of resources and uh, the best uh, service provision to the final users? Question number three is why and how should cryptocurrencies be regulated? It's a, and it, what is interesting in the, in the domain of banking economics is that you, you have the impression that it's always the same question that come back uh, cyclically in a, in, a, in a cyclical pattern. Uh, this question of should money be private or public? What is the fraction of the money that is, should be provided by private banks? And what is the fraction that should be provided by uh, the central bank or public authorities? And it, it goes back and forth, and it's, it's, it's an, an old question uh, being re-examined in the light of technological innovations. Another important aspect that I will briefly touch upon is the impact on, of payments on privacy and data markets. One crucial characteristic of physical cash is anonymity of transactions. And if, we, if physical cash disappears, uh, and is replaced by digital uh, currencies, uh, is anonymity going to be preserved uh, for, for the good or for bad? And what are the consequences on privacy and data markets? And finally, I will address this question of, is it really a good idea to create a CBDC? And if, it's, if it is the case, how to design it? Because there are many different possibilities for designing a CBDC. And so I insist again, feel free to uh, ask questions and interrupt me if, if you, you, you want clarifications or you have comments. Okay, so if there are no uh, questions at this stage, I will uh, uh, essentially explain to you what we do in the paper, which is, as, as I told you, still very preliminary. Essentially, uh, what we do is, uh, is, uh, is dear to my heart because it's uh, integrating two uh, topics on which I've been working for, for many years. One is two-sided markets and uh, the other is banking economics. Okay, so we have in the model, we have two sectors or two types of activities. One is uh, online, for example, e-commerce, but it could be also social, social network, but let's focus on Amazon or Alibaba, it's e-commerce. 
and uh, the point of sale. So you, you, you have physical uh, brick and mortar uh, uh, sh shops. And so you, you want to be able to, so some goods are bought online, some goods are, are bought physically. So in the current situations, the, we have basically three types of payment instruments. We have bank, what I call bank transfers, which could be, uh, you know, card payments or mobile payments or checks or other things. But essentially the idea is that you're moving uh, money from bank accounts to another. And you have the more or less developed stable coin issued by the platform. And I will come back to what I mean by say stable coin, but it's the idea that the platform is creating or issuing its own currency to, to some extent. For the physical uh, transactions, the point of sale, payments, then uh, basically the, the trade-off is between bank transfers, card or mobile, and physical cash. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> physical cash guarantees anonymity, but the bank services are bundled with credit. So the, the, the bank payment services are bundled with credit. So for example, if you uh, use your bank account, you may uh, benefit from the possibility of having a, a credit line or having a overdraft or this kind of thing. On the other hand, the platforms, the platform here, there will be only one platform, uh, uh, does something different. It bundles payments with matching services. The idea that, for example, a platform is going to find you the best product on the internet and is going to use the data the information collected on your behavior, in particular your payments, uh, in order to find for you the best product you can think of. So this has a positive side, which is that it improves the allocation of resources, but pre presumably the platform is going to collect the majority of the surplus. So it's not necessarily good from a, from a consumer welfare perspective. So in this model, we have three payments instruments that they call C, B, and S. We have central bank money that will be uh, initially uh, physical cash. And then we will replace it by uh, electronic cash or CBDC. You have the digital money issued by banks, which is essentially bank deposits, the, the, uh, classical uh, private money that we are used to. And we have the, the new thing, which is the stable coin issued by the platform. Uh, which could be, as I said, e-commerce or social network, but for, for simplicity, I will focus on the e-commerce. And so you have these two types of transactions. B and S compete for online uh, activities because obviously you cannot use cash for online, online purchases. However, if the CBDC is created, then the central bank currency could potentially be used also for online transactions. And C and B, which is the uh, central bank money or the cash, if you like, and uh, bank transfers compete for the point of sale transactions. So it's the physical uh, activities. And also there is this possibility that the so-called the tipping or, or leveraging on this market power, since the, the platform is really big, uh, it may convince uh, consumers to use also their uh, stable coins, their, uh, their DM or their other uh, cryptocurrencies or stable coins for purchasing also at the point of sale. And the, the shop, the, the merchant may be forced to accept it if the market power of the platform is big enough. So it's basically an extension of my paper with uh, Jean on, uh, on uh, credit cards, essentially. It's the, the, really the same idea, it's except that you have, so yeah. So, go sorry, ahead. one uh, clarifying question. So the platform in the model does not offer financial services. So That's here the, at this stage, the platform is only offering uh, payment on top of its, uh, but uh, it's, it's a, you, you're perfectly right. Uh, it's also interesting to see what happens when the platform also offers uh, financial services. But for the moment, we, we don't deal with that. We, we, we assume that the, the superiority of the bank, if you like, is to be able to provide credit. And for the moment, we assume that the platform does not provide credit. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. One other okay, question. so uh, what we do is an extension of uh, uh, my paper with Jean. I think Seth has another question. Sure. 
so is the the fact that the online platform can't accept cash important? It's because I think in places like, for example, yesterday, Grab went public. Grab is a big e-commerce platform in Indonesia, and they have lots of outlets that actually will enable people to, to use cash because uh, obviously not everybody has access to digital finance. No, no, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, I try to focus on the advanced uh, economies, but you're right that in full generality, uh, uh, accepting physical cash could be also a possibility. But the, the point is that there will be transaction costs. That is uh, probably the fees of the intermediaries and it will not be the preferred technological solution. Uh, but I agree with you that this is conceivable. Okay, so what I was saying is that it, um, uh, implicitly uh, behind all that, uh, you have banks, you have the different business models for the, the way in which the payments are processed. You have, for example, the classical bank transfer model where you have the bank of the, the merchant, the, the, the acquirer, and the bank of the uh, consumer, the issuer, that have uh, the, 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 their arrangements between themselves, in particular in terms of interchange fees, and this interchange fees could be regulated. And we also have the possibility for the platform to, uh, to control everything. So it's in a sense, the platform is, is, a, is a, a bit similar to uh, Amex. Uh, uh, in a sense, it's the, the three-party system rather than the four-party system. But I don't want to go into that. Uh, there are so many items I would like to deal with that I will not uh, go into the, the detail of the model. So what we do is first, we analyze the laissez-faire situation where there is no interventions by uh, the government. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, the payment system is fragmented in the sense that the users need at least two accounts or two types of tokens. You have the physical cash, you have the, you have the uh, bank, bank deposits, and you have also uh, the stable coin. <coughs> so the fragmentation may not be fully optimal from a social perspective. Uh, another thing is that the platform may use its uh, market power to oblige consumers and merchants to use its stable coins for online payments, but this could be ruled out by the, by the regulators. The question is, is it a good idea to rule it out? Similarly, the platform may, may leverage its market power for online activities to encourage the use of its stable coin on the physical market. But again, this could be, uh, this could be prohibited by regulation. And uh, the interesting point from a technological and preferences point of view is that if uh, stable coin replaces cash for certain transactions, then there's a loss of, presumably a loss of privacy. If the stable coin replaces bank transfer, presumably there is a loss of the credit option. Although as Milo pointed out, the platform could also uh, provide uh, credit uh, services. And uh, there is also the, the, the argument that uh, we developed with Jean in another paper on the must take card argument, namely that if the platform has a sufficient market power, it may oblige the uh, merchants to accept the card, to accept the stable coin, sorry, even, even if it's very expensive, if the merchant fees are high. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the second, uh, um, time, we look at what regulation alone can do. That is, we, we don't allow for uh, private, uh, for public provisions of services. We just look at the, the government as a regulator and not as an operator, if you like. Sorry, Jean-Charles, sure. can, can, can I ask a, um, a question? So in your setting, what would be the, the first best organization of so the market? You, I mean, uh, as I said, um, there are many, uh, assumptions that need to be clarified. And at this stage, what I have in mind is that uh, the, the share of the transactions which will be uh, processed by the different payment instruments uh, uh, depends on the characteristics of the transactions. A, a, a bit like in my model with Jean, the, basically there is a convenience benefit for, in my model with Jean, there is a convenience benefit for the point of sale transactions where uh, you have a uh, um, benefit from uh, using uh, cash, uh, sorry, a benefit from using the card or a cost from using the cash. So depending on this, uh, this realization, uh, the, uh, this random variable, you have a fraction of the transactions that are held with card and a fraction held by, uh, paid by cash. And so the same is true here. Uh, that is for the, there would be a, a certain interior 
market sharing between stable coins and and uh, and credit uh, and sorry and uh, and credit card or bank cards for the uh, for the online transactions depending for example if you need credit on these transactions or if uh, privacy is an issue or if i mean different uh, the, the different types of uh, considerations. So it's the same idea that uh, there is a uh, first best uh, that could be defined depending on the, the list of the parameters that I gave you. And of course, the, the question is whether this uh, optimal allocation can be implemented by regulation alone, or do we need on top of that uh, public provision? So let, let me move on because there, there are many things I would like to, to discuss. John, so the, can I just have one question? Yeah. So I'm just wondering when you talk about the loss of privacy in some situations that may be incremental, like Amazon is able to figure out a lot about us without using Amazon coin. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if you can think about a regulation of cryptocurrency separate from data privacy regulation. No, no, you, you, you're absolutely right. The, um, uh, the, the platform already has uh, uh, some information of my on my uh, car, on my preferences for example even if uh, I pay with another instrument so I, I will come back to that um, at the end but you, you are very uh, ahead of me so I would like to, to to really start by the basics and then we, we would discuss this uh, this uh, this aspect but it's very very good question uh, so the first thing we we um, the regulators could do, is uh, look at the stability of the stablecoin in the sense of, uh, of prudential regulation. And this is the spirit of the, 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 the recent um, uh, report of the US president working group on stable coins, really this idea that we have to be sure that the stable coins are stable, uh, that there will be no run. And uh, that, so it's very much like a, a narrow bank you have to be, or a money market fund actually. You have to be sure that the assets of the stable coin of the platform that issues a stable coin are really invested in in uh, in uh, in goods that are in assets fin uh, financial assets that are not re risky or that uh, or is uh, over collateralized. So you you want to avoid the risk of run. So this is in effect considering the platform as a bank uh, or a narrow bank to some extent. Another important uh, aspect of regulation is the uh, to force interoperability between the stable coins and bank deposits, for example. As I said, in this model, we have a fragmentation of the payment system. You have different payment instruments. So I would not say that we have really different monies. I can uh, discuss that later. Maybe it's the uh, euro or the dollar everywhere, especially if uh, the first point is insured, that is there is a one-to-one -one, uh, conversion of the stable coin in, in uh, euro or dollars. But, uh, you still have fragmentation. You, need, you still need to have several bank, several accounts, several types of tokens or, or accounts. And so uh, you, you want to, to encourage, uh, to, to minimize the transaction costs between transferring money from the different kinds, and in particular requiring interoperability. There could be also issues uh, related to what I was talking about, namely the use of uh, inter interchange fees in order to pump up uh, merchant fees, uh, to avoid the, this exploitation of the must take card argument. As I said, uh, there is this question of uh, uh, prudential regulation, which I already alluded to in the first point, uh, where you want to uh, essentially regulate payment service providers, even if they are not non-banks, if they, they, they don't, uh, of credit activities, you, you, you want to regulate them to avoid uh, runs. Another aspect of regulation is, of course, antitrust uh, because of the market power of the platforms. But I mean, to some extent, the whole movements on uh, you know, open banking was initiated by the, the observation that there was not enough competition in the banking sector. So it's not only uh, competition for plat between the the, the, I mean, in the, in the online activities, but also for traditional banking activities. And finally, this question of a level playing field between banks and non-banks payment service providers. So let me move on because I'm running out of time. Already. Um, the uh, third point that we, we examine in the paper 
is the impact of implementing a, a fast or instant payment system. You know, many countries have adopted uh, this uh, fast payment system, which is clearly an improvement, uh, but different styles of instant payment system are possible. <coughs> I listed here a few examples, more or less in a chronological order. Uh, in 2004, uh, Mexico started this system, a SPY or a CODI, which is operated and regulated by the central bank. So the central bank does everything. Uh, in the UK, it was different. The faster payment system is operated by private banks and it's only regulated by the Bank of England. In the, uh, Sweden, uh, it started slow because SWISH was only essentially a person-to-person -person, uh, payment system. But then it, 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 uh, it evolved to include a per person to, to businesses. And it uses QR codes, that is, you don't need to have a bank account. You need to have some key or a bit like uh, in India with the, or, or in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, you, you, you don't, I mean, sorry, not in India, but in Brazil, you, you don't need a bank account. The, the PIX system in Brazil is also uh, very efficient. And it's, uh, if you compare with the Swish, for example, uh, it's universal in the sense that you have all kinds of payments, person to person, person to businesses, business to businesses, uh, person to government, uh, business to government, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't need a bank account, okay? So non-banks payment service providers can allow you indirectly access to, to PIX. And it, it works with a key, which could be your email address, your cell phone number or a QR code, okay? Uh, UPI in India is also similar, except that it uh, still, uh, we, uh, if I'm not mistaken, limited to, uh, to bank accounts. But you have this mixed system where it's operated by uh, uh, an entity which is a private public uh, partnership and it's regulated by the, by the central bank. And it, interestingly, I mean, although we have tips in the, in the euro area, the FedNow project is still lagging behind. And it's, uh, it's very interesting to see that emerging countries are much ahead of the, of the US or uh, even the euro area uh, because they have uh, to some extent uh, leapfrogged to the, to the new generation of uh, payment system. Uh, and the last thing we do in the paper is uh, we, we look at the impact of the central bank digital currency. And the, the question we ask is, what is it that you can obtain with public provision? That is the, the government himself providing a payment service to some extent. Uh, what is it that you can do uh, with public provision that you cannot do with regulation alone? And so you could think, well, maybe it's related to the imperfections of the regulatory system. And in fact, if you look at the, uh, the um, uh, experiments, uh, different experiments of regulation of credit card interchange fees in the world, and Jean and I will have worked a lot on this, uh, these questions, uh, they are not very successful. And uh, interesting, I mean, there are several episodes, I, mean, I don't want to go into the detail, but the latest one, if I'm not mistaken, is that Amazon, has decided to reject UK uh, visa uh, cards since Brexit, simply because Visa decided to increase massively uh, the interchange fees uh, before they could not, because there was this uh, rule in the European, there was this cap on interchange fees in the European uh, uh, Union. And since uh, uh, Britain has left, uh, now Visa has uh, raised interchange fees. So they, it shows that the uh, regulation of interchange fee doesn't work very well. So one, one, one idea is that a CBDC can do two things. First of all, stimulate competition for payments and also for credit, but also eliminates the risk of domination of a, a, a limited number of platforms uh, like we have seen in China. And I will come back to that uh, in, in a moment. Uh, but the, the problem is, one of the problems that I see with this uh, public provision is that it's difficult to uh, preserve competitive neutrality if the central bank is both a supervisor and an operator. So we have to think of a, uh, um, a regulatory uh, structure that avoids this lack of competitive neutrality. And to some extent, this kind of mixed duopoly uh, solution or mixed oligopoly solution exists already for large value payment systems 
because in most uh, developed countries, you have for, for interbank uh, payments, for large value interbank payments, you have a coexistence of a private system run by the banks themselves and a public system run by the central bank. And the, this issue of competitive neutrality is uh, already uh, there. And finally, I would like to insist on something which is a, which is a bit surprising in some way, is that a priori you would like to minimize transaction costs, right? You would like to say, I can transfer my different uh, money from the, my different accounts or from one uh, token to the other without transaction costs. <coughs> Excuse me. But if you do that, you, you augment the risk of a digital run because if it's very easy for a user, for a consumer to transfer all his money from one account to the other, it's a possible vehicle for instability of the system. So now that I have told you exactly the, the type of approach that we have started to adopt, I would like to insist on uh, five fundamental questions. As I said, they are, they are relevant to the, to the assumptions, to the modeling strategy, but also to the policy interpretation of our results. And I will uh, start by the, this uh, question of the economies of scope between deposits and credit. <coughs> so are these economies of scope between deposits and credit still relevant? So as I, as I told you, this is what I teach in my Banking 101 course. And it's an old idea of Fisher Black in 1975. That is the traditional business model of banks is to manage deposits and credit. And there is an economy, there are, there are economies of scope between the two. Uh, because by managing deposits, banks learn something about the credit worthiness of customer. However, this business model can be disrupted by fintech. And I believe that Uday is going to present uh, this paper with uh, Christine Parlor and Zhu, <coughs> where they look at the competition between fintech and traditional banks for payment services. And the uh, entry of FinTech stimulates competition from payments, but may reduce bank lending because it makes you know, uh, the funding of the, the banks more costly. Of course, when the, you allow FinTech uh, to, to sell payment data to the lenders, then uh, the, the, the part of the, this effect uh, disappears. But uh, interestingly, the impact on consumer welfare is ambiguous. But I don't want to say too much because I think Udai would be in a best, better position to explain his results. Uh, another thing which is uh, important, <coughs> excuse me, is that uh, when uh, you introduce the possibility of fintech lending, then uh, when borrowers share their data, which is the, the hope of the European Commission that uh, PSD2 and the open banking, the, the idea that there is not enough competition for lending. And so uh, if you open, uh, if you allow consumers to, to, to uh, give access to their data uh, to third party providers, then it would, be, it would be wonderful because it would stimulate competition between them. Problem is that He Wang and Zhu have shown that uh, there may be unintended uh, consequences of this phenomenon that, uh, in fact, at the end of the day, consumer welfare may decrease uh, after open banking is introduced. Another interesting uh, paper that will be presented, I believe, uh, after, the, after my, my talk, um, which is this paper by uh, Gosh Valley and, and Zhang, uh, and I think it's Yao who will present it. This is why his name appears in, 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 in bold, uh, which is this idea that uh, the, the data on the cashless payment allow fintech lenders to evaluate credit worthiness of firms uh, better than banks. And so uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the presentation because I want to, to uh, there is something I don't fully understand. They, uh, this is a, a citation from their abstract. And they say that, the synergy between cashless payments and credit supports data sharing and open banking and leads to, an, and I quote them, an alternative banking model without a balance sheet or traditional banking relationship. So the idea is basically that you're going to uh, 
revolutionize banking by exploiting this uh, synergy between payment data, cashless payment data and, uh, and, and, and lending. But I, I, I slightly disagree with that, and maybe that's a misunderstanding on my part, because I believe that the synergy is really uh, uh, something that uh, it, uh, underlies the, uh, the, the traditional business model of banks, so it's going back to, to Fisher Black. Uh, and uh, what um, Gorge Valley and Zeng focus on is, is a different thing, is the relationship banking, the, the idea that you need to have several periods of um, relationship so that the bank accumulates or produces soft information inside the bank. And this is opposed to the more modern type of artificial intelligence use of big data on payments, which is a hard information produced outside the bank. Okay, so you, you have the, of course, the, the choice between the two techniques, but I believe that in the current state of the regulation, there is, not enough, there is not really a level playing field between banks and non-banks. In the sense that banks contribute to improving the system by producing this data or by uh, giving the access to this data, <coughs> but they, they cannot benefit from it, okay? So my question to, to Yao and his co-authors is, what if traditional banks also use FinTech methods? And maybe after all, big tech platforms pose a most serious threat to uh, traditional synergies and fintech. And this is what I really think because banks could buy fintech companies, could use fintech technology, artificial intelligence. But there is something more serious, which is related to the big tech platforms, not the fintech, but the big tech. And so there is this paper by Berg et al, which shows that digital footprints, in other words, what you do on the internet, predict consumers' default better than traditional credit scores. And similarly, there is this paper uh, of my two co-author, uh, Jean and, and, uh, and Yoon uh, and others on uh, a big tech uh, credit in uh, Argentina, where they show that the small Argentine firms that use big tech credit perform better than their competitors. So is it after all the, the end of bank lending? So this is related to my, my question of the survival of uh, traditional banks. And finally, uh, sorry, it's not finally, it's uh, still two, two slides. The, 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 I was talking of the two tier structure of the payment system. Eh? Re remember bank offerings, payments and credit services to final users and central bank uh, only managing the transfer of reserve between banks. Is it something that we want to preserve? Is it something that is efficient in a digital economy? Because there is a simple alternative, which is essentially already in place in some countries to some extent in the, in Switzerland or UK and Mexico, <coughs> which is to offer a real-time payment system uh, to everyone, including non-banks and large corporations. So this is related to the design of the CBDC. What, what, what kind of, who has access to bank reserves and who has access to central bank reserves and who has, ac has access to the uh, fast payment system allowing to uh, 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 to transfer them. And this is related to the title of this uh, paper of Dirk Nipelt, Reserve for All, with a question mark, as opposed to something more intermediated, where the uh, CBDC would not disrupt the two tier structure of the payment system. Finally, I would like to say that uh, the, the, the question is also related to what the Brenner Meyer et al. consider to be a fundamental change in the business model in the or in the, in the structure of the payment industry, before the banks were at the center of the model and they were mediating a relation between different types of consumers offering different types of services. And now it seems that the center is really not, it is not really the bank itself, but the platform that provides access to different kinds of services, but it's not the bank itself. The lending activities is outsourced somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll come back to that when I talk about China. So now, second point, uh, the consequences of the new scope economies between payments and core platform activities. As, as we know, the big tech giants, and uh, I give you, uh, I will uh, uh, illustrate it by N Group and, uh, and uh, Facebook or Meta, as it's called now, view themselves as quote unquote, lifestyle platforms or 
metaverse, which we use the terminology of Zuckerberg, uh, where users spend, can spend if they want their entire lives. Yeah. You don't have to, to be in the real world. You can uh, use a, you, be on, only on the, on, the, on the platform. You can chat with friends, watch videos, order meals, buy goods, books for events, et cetera, and pay your bills. So why would you need a bank account when your platform, for example, and financial, can offer you all the financial services that you can dream of. The scope economies between e-commerce and, and, uh, and, uh, and payments started by a very simple escrow account that were used to build confidence between the buyer and the seller. You, know, you buy something on the internet, you don't know if it's, uh, it's exactly what you want, the seller don't know if you're gonna pay. So the idea is that you put some money in deposits with the platform. And then when uh, you give the green light to the transactions, then the, flow, the money goes to the seller. But I mean, immediately uh, Alibaba realized that it was uh, very easy to extend it uh, to add uh, many other financial services to this simple uh, um, uh, app. And this is, <coughs> Sorry. And this is what we have now. The M group is a fantastic uh, conglomeration of different activities. So Alipay on, on online and mobile payment, Jibai on small business lending, my banks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so if you look at the, the chart on the uh, right, you can see that the structure of the revenue of the M group which was initially uh, concentrated on payments in dark blue, is now much more diversified and includes credit in light blue, uh, insurance and asset management. But of course, there was a regulatory backlash. As we know, in November 2020, the Chinese authorities decided of a rectification plan, restructuring of N Group in a financial holding company submitted to presidential regulation and supervision by the Bank of China. By the way, it's very similar to the conclusion of the US president working group. A stripping of Alipay platform from financial products, consolidation of lending operation into a single entity, the Chongqing uh, um, uh, and uh, commercial finance, and the downsizing of your bow, which was this uh, huge money market fund that grew of the, the simple escrow account used for uh, customers uh, by, uh, for, of Alibaba. And so the official motivation, of course I write official because I know that there were also political uh, issues, but the official motivation we, we, which we have to take into account were the protection of consumer rights and the privacy, limitation of market power, and also the notion of a level playing field between all kinds of competitors, financial intermediaries, the banks themselves, the FinTech PSP, the, the, the non-banks uh, payment service providers, and maybe the other big tech because uh, Alipay is not, Alibaba is not the only one. You have also Tencent and Baidu and, and all those. So let me now move on to the third question. And as I said, there are more question marks than, uh, than uh, answers. Why and how should cryptocurrencies be regulated? So of course there is the, this whole debate about uh, the denationalization de of money. It comes back and forth uh, regularly. But, so the idea that uh, maybe it's more efficient to have competing monies uh, and uh, that the monopoly of the government is not a good idea. But if you look at the facts, competition between private monies uh, doesn't work so well because of the complexity of uh, you know, exchange uh, rate risk, you have to, to, to transform one into the other. You have a transaction cost, you have risks run. And so you, if you look at a recent example of the free banking era in the US in the 19th century, more recently, the Liberty dollar that lasted only 11 years in the US doesn't seem to be working very well. <coughs> I will not touch upon uh, the Bitcoin uh, um, aspects of the, 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 the um, the cryptocurrencies in general, I will focus on stable coins. The reason being that, uh, first of all, there, are, there, are, uh, uh, there is already a large literature though, to which uh, Catherine has uh, contributed uh, 
eminently, but also uh, the, uh, it's more a vehicle for speculation in my opinion, rather than a payment instrument. Uh, so I will not talk about that. I will, I will concentrate on stable coin. Stable coin, which I believe are a more promising instrument. And uh, the characteristic is that in principle, their value is pegged to one official currency, the dollar or the euro. And to some extent, they are very similar to money market funds that provide the payment uh, services. So even if you have the same currency everywhere, so if you're, even if those stable coins, you consider them as dollars or euros, the payment system is, a, is a fragmented. And even if you uh, prohibit any fees for transferring one into the other, which is already a big, uh, a big assumption, even in this case, you still have a fragmentation because you have to manage several accounts and it's more complicated, less efficient than having a single, uh, a single uh, payment. So I'm not sure, uh, and this is something uh, I would like to, 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 see, to, to discuss with you, is I'm not sure that in the long run, many cryptocurrencies can survive. Uh, so there is this issue of platforms and tokens. There is already a, a large literature uh, on the incentives of platforms to issue their own uh, tokens, if you like. <laughs> and as you and Rogoff point out, this is not new. We, we used to have uh, stamps, we used to have uh, air miles, etc. So the idea that you want to encourage customer loyalty, and to some extent, it's uh, also a, a way to exert market power because you want to, to lock in uh, your consumers to some extent. But interestingly, you and Rogoff uh, show that in their paper, at least in their set of assumptions, the platforms make more profit if the tokens that they issue are non-tradable. That is, they have to be exclusively used for uh, buying items on the platform. So, so the platforms do not want to issue money, that uh, general purpose money. Brunner Meyer and Pine in a, in a paper that I've, I've only seen the, the slides, but not the paper itself. I couldn't find it, but I discussed with Marcus a little bit. Uh, so they have a different view. They, they consider that uh, in the digital era, uh, you can do better. So it's not the, the old uh, stamps uh, things in the, of the 50, 1950s. It's something more, you, you, you can view digital tokens as what they call smart bills of exchange in the sense that you can do more things, you, you can use a, it's a programmable money, you can use smart contracts and stuff like that. <laughs> and they compete with traditional currencies because they can be both a means of payment and store of value. But then if you want to have a store of value, uh, you need to maintain a reputation, you need to avoid runs. And there is a trade-off because this is costly. There is a trade-off between senior age revenue and cost of maintaining uh, reputation. Uh, uh, Michael uh, uh, and Wei uh, have a, an interesting paper where they uh, argue that tokenization might be a commitment device to prevent a platform from abusing its users. It's a, it's a more appealing funding scheme for platforms with the weak fundamentals, but probably not a means of payments. And there you have to draw the line between crypto assets and, and cryptocurrency. There, there, there are different things. Uh, what are the challenges created by stablecoin? Well, if I go to this uh, report, the US president uh, of the working group on stablecoins, I quote uh, Yellen's uh, introduction. She says, stablecoins have the potential to support beneficial payment option, but, and there is a big but, current oversight is inconsistent and fragmented. And the concerns are there might be the destabilizing runs, there might be fragmentation of the payment system. There can be excessive market powers of the issuers, especially when they become big. Uh, of course, you could, uh, you could uh, argue that uh, this report has been written uh, under the influence of the US banking industry. And also the regulators and the FDIC in particular, they have their own political interest in there. But basically the recommendations of this uh, working group are interesting. And as I said, they basically require stable coins issuers to be to be to be regulated uh, regulated financial institutions like banks you know uh, impose uh, 
maybe capital requirements, liquidity requirements, and the minimum is the guarantee that the assets are safe or over collateralized. Similarly, they, they want to require the, the, the other intermediaries, which are the, the non-bank PSPs or the custodial wallet providers to be, to be supervised. Question is how much, what, what kind of supervision? There is something I, I never understood in the US regulatory literature, which is this obsession for the separation of banking and commerce. I don't, I don't think in Europe we have the same obsession, but that basically they want to separate stable coin issuers from commercial entities, and this is not entirely clear to me. And finally, again, this notion of interoperability, interoperability between, between stable coins, which is also very uh, easy to understand. Now, let me uh, briefly discuss the impact of uh, payment methods and privacy in data markets. As I said, and as you know, physical cash preserves privacy. That, that's essentially a big reason why it's still used a lot in some countries like uh, Switzerland or, or even in the US. Sorry, now, can I ask a clarifying oh, question? Sure. So can you explain what interoperability between stable coins means? Because I don't understand why people say that. Say, say it again, what, what is the question? When we say interoperability between stable coins, is that is that not just the currency exchange? Like, how does that look different from currency exchange? No, but I, I guess it has not only to the, uh, the fact that you can exchange one with the other as a, as a feature, the one, one for one, uh, as a parity, if you like, at par, but also presumably uh, uh, regulation of the fees. Because um, if you have a par, uh, but there is, a, there is a big fee uh, for the intermediary, effectively, there is no interoperability. So I think it has to do with the regulation of uh, interchange fees, basically. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I was uh, talking of uh, physical cash and privacy. Uh, for digital monies, it depends a lot on the way they are designed. And in fact, uh, you don't want to eliminate the use of data because I believe that uh, data generates huge network effects. It's a so-called DNA, DNA loop, data network activities. If you get data on the payments, then you can offer better services. But the problem is that these uh, network effects, you don't want to kill them, but they can be a mixed blessing for users. On the one hand, the DNA loop can create a, a virtuous circle driving greater financial inclusion. And this is particularly the case in emerging countries, better services and lower costs. On the other hand, it may impel the market for payments towards further concentration. And uh, let's look at the example of China where Tencent and Alipay have like 85 or more percent of the, of the market of payments. Uh, there is a literature on big tech and big data, but it's not specifically focused on payments. And so you have the paper of Kirpalani and Filippo, where platforms gather data about users and they sell it to merchants, etc. I will not go into that uh, because um, I'm running out of time, essentially. And again, uh, Michael has, uh, has an interesting paper with you and, uh, and Wei Zhong, where the uh, platform's extensive access to user data may allow them to take advantage of users' vulnerability. I have to skip it because I'm running out of time. There is also this uh, literature on privacy, the market for data. The notion that the data on previous purchases allow firms to try to discriminate users. Uh, in particular, the Taylor and uh, Calsolari Pavan paper. You also have the, the paper by uh, Doshin and his co authors on the fact that individuals do not fully internalize the cost of losing privacy when consumer tastes are correlated with observable characteristics. And finally, there are a couple of papers by Garrett and co author who uh, rightly point out the fact that when payment data provide information about consumer taste, in the long run, the only stable outcomes of those models are uh, data monopolies. That is, there is a tipping phenomenon. At the end, only one big platform uh, survives. And they argue, uh, I don't fully understand the argument, but they argue that electronic cash, a CBDC, may be a way to uh, monetize this privacy and avoid the use the, the, of the market power by the data monopoly. So let me finish by discussing why creating a CBDC and how to design it. 
first reason, of course. John, shall, just to tell you, I know this is the last question, but uh, it's five minutes. Five minutes, okay, perfect. So uh, a first reason, which is perfectly uh, reasonable and that is um, uh, put forward by uh, uh, central banks, is that we do that because it responds to users' need. And it's, it's true that in many countries, the share of cash and daily transactions is falling, especially in the European, uh, uh, in the Euro area, for example, or in the, uh, uh, but not so much in the US and not so much in Switzerland. <coughs> and uh, the, so the, the argument goes that it's a part of the central bank mandate to provide legal tender to all in a convenient form to a central bank money. And so if people don't want cash anymore, you will give them digital cash. Another reason which I believe is really important in the, in the back of the mind of the regulators is that they are fed up with merchant fees for credit cards and even debit cards. So there is this, uh, this uh, old debate on the, the huge costs of digital payments for merchants through the manipulation of interchange fees. So in many countries, uh, even if digital payments are more efficient than cash, they are also very expensive. So the, the idea there is to stimulate competition. However, there is a, a large literature. This is a, a, a subsample of the papers uh, of the mostly uh, macro monetary papers who argue that be careful with the CBDC because it may lead to a digital run. That is, if it's very uh, efficient and simple and costless for, you, uh, for depositors to put their money in the central bank rather than at the at the commercial bank, they will do it. And so it will be more efficient, but it will also crowd out bank deposits. It will raise banks' funding costs and decrease investment. So some people like Dirk Nippel suggest that the central bank could so quote unquote recycle the fund but lend it to the banks. But this is not always a good idea because it may expose the bank, the central bank to counterparty risk and favoritism. It's not the role of the central bank to lend to the private sector. So the idea here the, that is defended by some, like uh, our Böhme, is that uh, you want to have a CBDC, yes, but the, what they call a minimally invasive. You, you want to maintain the two-tier structure with commercial banks and central bank, but they, in a minimum way, in a way that does, does not perturb the two-tier uh, payment system. And the idea is to have a limited financial system footprint in a way that the idea is that CBDC could be designed to have a limited financial system uh, in, uh, footprint like cash today. And this chart shows you the volume of cash in, in circulation, as uh, cash in red, as opposed to bank deposits in blue, as a percentage of GDP in, many, in several countries. And as you can see, uh, cash, even if it's still used for retail uh, transaction, <coughs> in terms of volume in circulation is very, very small. And you want maybe to do the same for CBDC. You don't want CBDC to be huge in terms of volume. So of course, you can think of different types of CBDC. As I said, the current system is a, the top system where the CBDC is only available to financial institutions. It's a two-tier system. And now you want to make it available to the general economy. And so you have different possibilities. And depending on the anonymity or pseudonymity that you want to preserve, you may have account based or token based. I don't, I don't have time to go into that. So let, let me finish by saying that there, there is one aspect in which I believe that CBDCs could be a big improvement to the quality of service for final users, which is cross border payments. Cross border payments are extremely expensive, and the organization of the foreign exchange market is a mystery to me. I don't understand. The way it is organized, the, 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 the flows that are huge, the, 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 the fees uh, that are very high, especially for retail users. So I don't think this is an efficient system. So suppose that uh, most countries agree to create CBDCs and connect uh, these CBDCs uh, through a, a, C, a, a more efficient uh, systems, then it could improve considerably the functioning of the foreign exchange market and it could improve the quality and, uh, and, and minimize the cost of service to the final users, which would be good for the economy. But of course, maybe some intermediaries would lose if this uh, organization is adopted. 
So let me conclude by saying that, as you all know, the payment system is a vital uh, element of the economy. For centuries, at least two or three centuries, it has been organized as a public-private partnership between the, the central bank and the commercial banks. And the digitalization of the economy implies a need to redefine this partnership. So of course, there is a pressure by central banks and regulators to implement the CBDCs. It's not entirely clear to me whether a CBDC is necessary to organize a socially optimal organization of the payment system. So maybe a fast payment system or instant payment system with an appropriate set of regulation could suffice. And in any case, I believe that a one size fits all solution is unlikely to be optimal. I believe that the pros and cons of CBDC depends on country specific, like for example, the user's preference for physical cash and anonymity, the degree of financial inclusion, and uh, finally, the intensity of bank competition and uh, data governance arrangements. And uh, I thank you very much and sorry for being a bit too long. Thank you very much, Jean-Charles, for a very interesting uh, talk and also for having raised our appetite for the next uh, paper in the session. <laughs> uh, I, I, I propose that we take a few minutes uh, from the break just to, if, if, if there are questions uh, for Jean-Charles, you can just speak or raise your hand. So I, I, I start. I just start with one. Uh, you mentioned a trade-off between uh, like value for privacy and and uh, and the data production that might depend, for example, on the degree of financial inclusion. So, so you seem to suggest that, for example, in in developing countries, the the value of generating data and so uh, being of, being able to offer other financial service might outweigh the value of, of privacy. Is this correct? Yes, but I mean, again, as I was uh, alluding to, uh, there is something intrinsic in the user's preferences for physical, uh, for anonymity. It's something, you know, in the DNA of the country, uh, people are used to a certain degree of privacy. And if you look at the surveys that have been done by the BIS, uh, if you compare the China situation and the Swiss situation, it's completely different, right? So there is one degree of, uh, of uh, idiosyncrasy in the preferences for anonymity. And then the, it depends a lot on the, what you can offer uh, to, the, uh, to the informal system in emerging economies. That is, of course, people are reluctant uh, to enter the formal system uh, because they, uh, they, uh, they uh, essentially don't want, they want to avoid taxes. But, but, but in the end, uh, it's the task of the government to uh, convince them that they will benefit a lot uh, from, uh, you know, uh, being part of the payment system, of the official payment system, in particular through the, the use of the um, government, uh, you know, poverty alleviation system or this kind of aids to the poor, uh, if they can be mediated through uh, these mobile payments or this, uh, you know, official payment system. I think that, that that's, a, that's a way to convince them uh, to um, uh, to participate. And then uh, several empirical work, for example, from my uh, colleague uh, Harald Hao in, in Geneva on, the, on China, on the fact, on the, you know, it's also the, this notion of the platform lending uh, being extremely efficient, in particular uh, Ali, Alipay and, and, uh, and Financial, extremely fin uh, efficient in stimulating small businesses. So in a sense, and maybe people will react, we don't agree with it, but in a sense, I would say that microcredit in the end was, was not very successful, but maybe, you know, mobile payments or fast payment systems could be a way to really stimulate investment for small businesses. I see Mathieu as a question. Yeah, hi, John Charles. So yeah, I had a question about this level playing field you talked about. So the fact that, you know, under PSD2, for instance, banks have to give access to information, but there is no reciprocity on the part of fintechs. And so I was wondering if you, like how, 
so, so is this actually calling for changing this regulation on you know ex, ex, the, the giving access to data and how what kind of regulation like how would the regulation like better regulation or a more fair regulation look like uh, if we really want to have let's say fair competition between big techs and and, um, and banks well it's a very good question uh, I, I believe it has to do with uh, you, we need a better understanding of the production of uh, new information that is so there is some data which is available and there are several ways to um, to uh, use it in particular credit scoring methods or you have this big data methods, uh, uh, machine learning, etc. So the question is, what is the best way to use this information uh, for the sake of the, for the public at the end? And uh, I must say that I, I don't have a clear answer to that, a clear view on that. So I, I think we have to, to dig a bit uh, more into the production of information. What does it mean? What kind of information is useful? And how can it be processed? 